Hello, I'm Dahlia. And I'm Alma. This is Nightmare on Fifth Street, a horror movie podcast. podcast. Like, <laughs> I bet you didn't know that. <laughs> In case you didn't know, we're going to talk about The Haunting. The Haunting. And this is what, okay, it's haunting. it's a movie that I fuck up it's the title. So oh my god, she's going to keep doing that, so I'm just going <laughs> to go on. I'll stop. Uh, I mess up the title of this movie so much mm-hmm. that even when I did the research for the season and I put it on the list, I put it wrong. Yeah. And you uh, had corrected it, but I have so used to calling it something wrong. Well, I didn't even it's know. not your fault. Okay, so here's the thing. So The Haunting, we're talking about the 1963 movie based on the novel by Shirley Jackson called The Haunting of Hill House. So yes. that's why you, you get it you get it messed up a lot because it is based on the novel haunting of Hill house. And then I believe if I remember correctly, I can't, I couldn't find, uh, I did find it, but I forgot to write it down. Actually. Um, there were, were different iterations of the title, but that it was finally yeah. settled on the haunting. So yes, it was yeah. going to be some combination of mm-hmm. the, and they shortened the movie title. Yeah. And I don't, I don't know why I thought that the, the title of the book is good. Mm-hmm. We have a remake of it and we also have the series which yeah. I highly recommend everybody watch. It's amazing. Um, and I usually don't get into series because my attention span. I'm like, I want to see everything. Same. I want to watch everything like all at once. I will yeah. wait till there's two seasons of something before I watch it. I just mm-hmm. get really annoyed. That one is standalone. It's great. And this movie is one of my top 10 favorite. Top 10, top 10. So, okay. yeah, it was really interesting reading some of the, like, some people love this fucking movie. And some people are like, oh, highly overrated. And you know what? I could see both sides of it. I personally really enjoyed it because I'm a sucker for a good ghost story. And while I'm watching this movie, I am feeling everything I felt as a little kid reading a ghost story. And I think they did it perfectly like the, and we'll, we'll get into that in a little bit, but with, with the knockings and the anticipation, the anxiety, all of that, I think this movie did it really, really fucking well. And that's, that's why for me, it, 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 it hit the marks for a, a haunting ghost story, whatever. Um, so yeah, I, I really liked it. Okay. So Alma, who directed it, uh, actors, all that good shit. Okay, um, this one is the 1963 British horror film directed by Robert Weiss and adapted by Nelson Gidding from the novel The Haunting of Hill House by Shirley Jackson. Richard Johnson plays Dr. John Markway. Is it Mark Goway? Like, I always want to add an extra syllable, Dr. John Markway. Julie Harris as Eleanor Nell Harris. Claire Bloom as Theodora, also Theo. Uh, Russ Tamblin as Luke Sanderson. Rosalie Crutchley as Mrs. Dudley, Valentine Dial as Mr. Dudley, and Lois Maxwell as Grace Markway. This I don't movie... think I mentioned the two bitch, the two bitches in the beginning. <laughs> Can I say bitches? Because I take it oh, personal. Okay, okay. Well, well, personal. when we start talking about the movie, we'll definitely talk about that because okay. yes, I got notes on that. As you know well. what's what's so interesting is that I will hate somebody like in like in real life because I know hate's a strong word, but it's it's silly. That's why I'll mention it that there's a character you don't like so much that you think of it like they're a real person. And therefore it's like, like, have you ever seen a character uh, on a movie? Um, and then in real life, you're just like, I can't watch anything they do. They, they were oh, totally yeah. Thick. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's very, very fucking hard. And then there's some people that end up showing you their true colors. <laughs> and it's like, ah, I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But okay. So I watched this on Prime Video, Alma. Where did you watch this? Yeah. Yeah, me too. Okay. And I think uh, I've watched it a, a few times. This is one of my favorites. Mm-hmm. I watched it a couple of times because when I rent it, I'll watch it a couple of times. I made the family watch it who hadn't watched it yet. I love making people watch it and staring at them the whole time. 
making sure they enjoy it. <laughs> you enjoy that fucking movie. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So uh, Alma, uh, I, I, she gave a little bit, but I'll, I'll read the the summary. That's just the movie. Hill House has mm-hmm. stood for about ninety years and appears haunted. Appears haunted. Hmm. Its inhabitants have always met strange, tragic ends, and now Dr. John Markway has assembled a team of people who he thinks will prove whether or not the house is haunted. Now he is a believer, a believer. I, believe. I don't know why I'm saying it like that. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so we we got a little mix there of people who he hopes that will support it. Now, why is this queer horror? Um, well. One of the characters is actually gay, and so this is not yes. like, uh, and uh, yeah, <laughs> and that's the character of Theo- Theodora, or they call her Theo in the movie. Theo. Um, and so there, there's like no, it's not like other movies where we're like trying to, like, is there a subtext here? Is it kind of implied? No, she's gay, <laughs> she in, in the novel and in the movie. So, um, and Claire Bloom is the actress who is playing her. And she has stated later in life that she was very proud of playing this character. So, I think yes, that was really and, cool. and lo- I love that. Um, I know we have, um, we have a bunch of trivia regarding this movie because this is an old movie. We have a lot of information, background. And a lot of times when these movies are adapted from books to films, we have so much more information on them because it took a lot of work to get it to be written as our screenplay and then adapted to film. And um, this book, this movie, I thought, what a great time that this is from 1963. I hate doing the math because then it's like so many years. Many so years, long ago. Many years. <laughs> and they chose to do this one in black and white. Uh-huh. Could have done it in color. The film censors demanded that Theo never be shown to touch Eleanor in order to keep the lesbianism less obvious. Less <laughs> obvious. Nevertheless, they touched yeah. several times. Many including, times. Including, yeah, when they're sitting on the bed, because in everyday life, if you know people, you're gonna you're living with them. You're gonna exactly. Them. And in the situation <laughs> where the situations they're put in in this yeah. movie too, it wouldn't have made sense if she never if they never laid hands on each other in any way. It was mm-hmm. never sexual. But who the fuck cares if it was sexual? But again, we're talking about the 19 fucking 60s over here. So, yes. but um, it's, it would it would have been very unnatural if they hadn't ever touched each other in a comforting way or any way at all. Mm-hmm. So, um, but yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm just gonna give the. Um, I, I saw a good question posed on um, somewhere. We always include trigger warnings and content warnings because I know yeah. movies have ratings. The rating system is more for parents to decide, am I going to take my kid to this movie? And yeah. then they break it down with uh, parental guidance and they'll tell you everything that's in a movie so that you can decide. We're adults, so we can just throw whatever we want on and it's our choice to put on and watch whatever we want we include trigger warnings, content warnings, because it's a we don't uh, we feel like the more information you have, the more you can avoid something that might um, you know trigger something for you. And I know these I are horror, and, yeah. And I th- even yeah. though it's horror and ghost stories, there's still some things that are hard to watch. Like, um, I mean, I, 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 yeah, I, I won't say it, but like, there's some things that are personal triggers for people, and like, I will avoid some things if I know yes. it's coming. I've Don't also fucking in- kill a dog in a movie. I'm not gonna watch Ali a movie. <laughs> <laughs> I just get you know, but I'm not. Uh, yes, exactly. For examples, there are different things that people just don't want to watch, and what the hell is wrong with that? I don't want to watch it, and that's fine. This movie is. Um, I included it for suicide, mm-hmm. implied child abuse. Mm-hmm. Um, so I put trigger warnings for mental health issues, and I also broke it down because I was looking at the parents' guide. And I was really offended. Uh, Ooh, I don't know. Offend me, did, offend me. The thing is that I understand some of the things that they'll put because everybody is like, well, it's PG-13, but also there's some mad words. I don't like kid cussing. Okay, I guess. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck ever. But, um, uh, this would, under sex and nudity, under sex and nudity, it is listed that it is implied repeatedly that Theodora is a lesbian. And I, I really took offense at that because I, at what what part uh, I don't there's no sex and nudity in the movie. 
Ah. So <laughs> is it because they're in their nightgowns, maybe? <laughs> no, but see, that's just, just like making shit up. That I know, mean, I know. I t- I'm trying to think. I, I but the think implication was... of someone's sexuality, when was that written? And if it was done in the 60s, it needs to be updated because it's 2021 and being gay isn't um, offensive. Well, I actually, so, you know, yeah, I, I'm not, I'm not offended, obviously, but what I read was that when Nell calls, um, she uses the words unnatural, if I remember correctly, to describe yeah. Theo, that was, um, that was actually terms that were used to describe um, homosexuality. So when she, she her a and, mistake of nature. Yeah. And so um, that obviously was a reference to her uh, homosexuality and she was hurt by it. But um, so that that's that's the reference. And I think at the time people would have known what she was talking about. So I think that. But again, I'm, yeah, it's, it's just fucking let's let's just pick. I mean, I think I saw her ankles five times. Oh, my God, I'm horrified. <laughs> um, <laughs> but anyways. All right. Before we begin uh, the movie, we do have a Patreon and we have lots of cool stuff going on over there. We have extra. I was about to say extra tidbits. I don't know what a tidbit is, but we got extra tidbits over there. Got- pieces of pineapple. Okay, all right. Pieces of pineapple over there. We got pieces of pineapple over there. I think that's what you call pineapple tidbits, right? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, okay. Extra <laughs> episodes over there. Uh, we're actually, we're going to start putting out some little mini articles over there as well for y'all. Alma's making a funny face, so maybe some pictures of these funny faces that she's doing over <laughs> <laughs> extra live streams, all that good stuff. Head on over to our Patreon, patreon.com slash nightmare movie podcast. And if you just want to, you know, do like a one-time donation, you can head over to our buy me coffee, buy me coffee.com slash nightmare pod. So I was just gonna say the movie opening up the music, the mood, everything. I'm in love with it. I love that they the I pay attention black and to white. the music in the movies. It's really interesting because I like that you do that because we notice different things about movies. I, I never listen to the music in movies. It's fun. I think it sets the mood and it's very like, but that's what I mean. Yeah, it's interesting because we, with the both of us, we get all the whole feeling Mm. of the movie together. Yeah. Um, The the house itself is a real house. And um, so the sets inside are what they built. But when you see the shots, you it's an actual standing house. One of the most beautiful shots that my kid pointed out to me was she was like, how the hell did they get that that shot um, where it's over the house and it zooms down yeah. so you can see all along the side? It's like they didn't have, you know, drones and <laughs> GoPros. How did they get up there? <laughs> like someone stood up there. Have you all seen One Cut of the Dead where they uh, they show you how they had like a, a ladder that they set up to look down on the set? Um, so that you could get that final shot. But then it ends up breaking and then it's like a pyramid of people uh, trying to get that shot. Well, anyways, um, they have their ways. And back then, they didn't have all these... Back, then, back in the safety, days of your... Safety measures. I laugh because the safety measures. Someone was probably hanging off the side. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. But they, but they did it. They did it. But they got it for us and now we can enjoy it. And I Lucky hope they us. lived. I hope they lived. <laughs> I didn't read anything in the trivia that they did, so I'm assuming they did. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Dr. John Barkway narrates the history of the 90-year-old Hill House, which to me wasn't believable. Every time I keep reading the 90 years, the house (laughs) is way old. It's way old, and even for 90 years, it Well, no, it makes sense. Look, if it was in 60, in 63, let's say 60. Okay, let's round it to 60. Mm -hmm. Uh, 60, 30, so that's 70. 1870, that makes sense. I don't know. It just looks so old and spooky to me. But also, we're out of that time. Where when you're out of a certain time period, yeah, um, things tend to look a lot older. Okay, so it was constructed in Massachusetts by Hugh Crane as a home for his wife. She died when her carriage crashed against a tree as she approached the house for the so first time. So embarrassing. 
For the first time, that's so sad. <laughs> Why well, I said that? I'm that sorry. is so mean. This Crazy movie was Mary. so triggering. Oh my god, I'm sorry. Just, I just have to get just out of like it. Just like the days of your quickly, he remarried because that's how you did it back then. Your wife is dead. Did he marry his 12 year old cousin? He married his 12 year old cousin, right? Because <laughs> that's how they did it. Wife. No, not this time. <laughs> his second wife was an adult. Are you sure? <laughs> she died. Also, she was 16. Okay, down the stairs. Uh, 16. Is I'm, that her age? I'm joking because I they like, married oh. really young cousins. It was gross. <laughs> Go on. His second wife died in the house from a fall down the stairs. Another like, oh no. Now uh, that's embarrassing. Daughter. If I ever died by falling down the stairs, <laughs> just Shut shove up. me, so just shove me into a hole and don't tell anyone. I don't want anybody to know that. <laughs> so embarrassing i have fallen so bad <laughs> when was it that i fell that i screamed i think i caught it on video uh, just to be screaming afterwards say leave me leave me to die yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh it was caught on your ring camera I correctly. <laughs> yes i did send you the video um oh god yeah that was so i was so humiliated i climbed back in the car and closed the door <laughs> to leave me <laughs> Craig's daughter Abigail lived in the house for the rest of her life, never moving out of the nursery room. She died calling for her nurse companion. The companion inherited the house, but later hung herself from a spiral staircase in the library. Okay, but remember her her companion, which was her nurse, that's just the way mm -hmm. I guess the, the terminology, um, didn't come because supposedly she was necking, she was necking with a boy over and there. And you know the trope if when you're, you know, all the shit happens because you're busy getting the sex getting the, you know <laughs> Why'd you say it like that? I was going to say something, something else here. I'm glad I stopped myself. The <laughs> house was eventually inherited by Mrs. Sam Anderson, although it has stood empty for some time. Okay, so we have a creepy house with a huge backstory. I like that they put that, they kept that because we do need some input into uh, why is this a haunted house? Yeah, why was uh, it haunted? With any good spooky story, I think it, it does good to have a good background. But this one, it's way messed up because there's way too many series of unfortunate events. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no. <laughs> but it's to me, originally watching this movie when I was young, um, I was like, I got creepy vibes about Mr. Crane because I'm like, oh, his wife just happens to get into a crash. And oh, yeah, absolutely. He fucking killed. The, he fucking mm -hmm. killed them. But that's that, that's we're not supposed to dwell on that. Yeah. And it's like she fell down this all these little accidents. I mm -hmm. mean, it's just it's really suspicious. But. I love that with the setting that you have here, the, the creepy sounds, the creepy noises, this mm -hmm. old house. Yeah, the cinematography. Secluded. It's all perfect, man. All of that sets this perfect tone for a spooky uh, ghost story. Okay, so, did you story. love the the shot, the scene when the second wife died falling down the stairs? <sighs> oh, my God, that was great. I fucking love that. Uh, just because, again, I, there's... This type of, I know there's a name for it and I can't remember, but this style of the way they, they filmed it, I it's just the way it follows her down and the way she's on the ground. It's very dramatic. The music, the lighting, everything is perfect. And I just love it. It's like, and you're not going to have any of take that a screenshot. if you fall down this, Dahlia. That's why they, no, you don't want to die like my that. My fucking like asshole will be up in the air. And like, <laughs> it'll be fucking like, I don't know. I have begged, please, if I ever fall or hurt myself and die, please, please put clothes on me. Please, oh. <laughs> for the love of everything holy, <laughs> don't call 911 until you put pants on me or clean me up or something. <laughs> Mark Way wishes to study the reported paranormal activity at Hill House and sends invitations for people to join his investigation. However, Mrs. Sanderson forces Mark Way to allow Luke Sanderson, her heir, to join. Only two individuals accept a psychic. Theodora and Eleanor Lance, who experienced poltergeist activity as a child. Eleanor spent her adult life caring for her invalid mother, whose recent death has left Eleanor with severe guilt. So we're introduced to Nell, which is our, our main um, character. And she lives with her sister, who is an asshole, and her brother-in-law, who is an asshole, and her nibbling, who is also an asshole. And she took care of, I empathize with this character so much to the point where I felt like too many personal attachments to this character. Like this was the most realist person um, 
I had ever seen when I first watched this movie, how she felt taking care of her mother. Um, I just really, really empathized with her. I could put myself in her shoes. Mm -hmm. She took care of her ailing mother until her death, every night getting up, her sleep interrupted. That does a lot to you and your mental health. Yeah. Um, I, I, I'm not obviously not a, you know, psychologist or anything, but I was the whole time I'm like, she suffers severely from this trauma that she had mm. from watching her mother slowly die with no help. And her family treats her like garbage. Like shit. She's, like fucking yeah. shit. Yeah. She wants to go to this house. She asks for permission. You I hated that. She's a girl. fucking grown ass adult. And she's asking she for permission. She used the vehicle to go to the Hill house. And the sister is like, no. And she's like, I paid for half of it. No. No, you live with us now. And I'm like, how awful that she did all that work and she isn't even left with a home Mm-mm. out of it or a car or anything. She's a fully grown woman who has devoted her whole life to this and now has nothing and has a shitty family. So that's why I was like, even in the remake, I hate those people too. <laughs> so that there's a reason that that's, that is the reason she seems to gravitate so easily and to the house. She wants to, she, and it was so sad the way she was calling it a vacation and all that. But you know what? At the end of the day, it probably was a fucking vacation to her because Dude, she hadn't been allowed to do shit. Exactly. She was looking at it as an escape, obviously, because living right now with her family is awful, but it always been awful. The fact that she called it was so wholesome that she thought of this as a vacation and leaving the house. Uh, dude, I go on vacation all the time to your house. And <laughs> yeah. so, it's a vacation whenever you go anywhere as an adult and you just have peace of mind. Yeah. And it was exciting. She Yes, was exciting. that's it. It was exciting. Beautiful home. And even if it's to do anything, why, why wouldn't it be? And, and we're going to touch too. upon it, too, in a little bit, too. But she she mentions a lot that she was chosen. They picked her, you know, that that's very important to her as well. Not only because she gets to leave this reality of hers for what she thought was just going to be for a little bit, but also she was chosen specifically for being herself, not randomly, not anything. She was chosen specifically. And that's, and that that's it really sad. Special. It makes her feel special. And yeah. I think, I, that's why I felt so much for her because I was like, that's how I would feel mm-hmm. in her situation. She feels like special for once when she doesn't, she's never had the light on her. Yeah. And so the group, they, they meet up at the house. It's a beautiful and they're checking it out. And it, and, and it was almost giving me that Winchester house vibe. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it was. Uh, yeah. There's secret passageways. It's beautiful. There's, there's, um, I think they described it here that says uh, off center perspectives and doors that open and close by themselves. That mm. part's a ghost. Duh. <laughs> <laughs> doors that open and close by themselves. So, uh, some trivia here Robert Wise shot the film in black and white, like you said, because he loved the depth and rich atmosphere, quality of black and white for his genre of film, and felt it would be perfect to enhance the moody psychological quality of the story. In addition, the studio contract specified that the film must be, and that's what you said, must be filmed in black and white. Also, the uh, f- it was filmed in a curvature so that it looked like the walls were closing in. That was another interesting um, aspect of the filming to create that kind of, uh, I don't know, spooky. I hate using the word spooky because I, I, I'm not very good with like synonyms and shit like that. Sorry. I bring up the very important in the library um, contains the ramshackle spiral case from which the previous owner had met her demise. That spiral staircase is so beautiful to me and I never forget it. I love love that they kept it in the remake and it's also in the series. That centerpiece, that Mm -hmm. way it spiraled that the whole house, everything Mm -hmm. It is significant, and I love the pieces that they were able to keep and the setting that they were able to make back in 1963 for us. I love that spiral case. I don't know what that material is called. I remember when I was stationed in Alaska, we worked out of this old hangar, 
And these hangers are huge. We had to go to the very top of that. So we had to climb stairs, basically, to get to the top to the observation point. And it was walking up these type of great grates. I don't know, whatever. But it reminded me of that because I remember I used to walk up these things and I used to just, you know, you could see right through the steps and the stairs. And then we had to walk across this this catwalk. And the catwalk is so long and so high and you could see through. I'm, I'm getting visions now of like not only that, but like yeah, uh, think Terminator 2 and shit like that. Or maybe I'm thinking of the wrong movie, but you know what I'm talking about. So anyways, while I'm watching this movie, I'm just thinking of, of that. And it, it is very not only heights, but you add that element of that type of see through kind of grading staircase. And it it, it adds a. Uh, anxiety i guess that's what i was trying to get at it ends this this so even though i did that fucking walk every day that i had a shift and it was always at night was the worst because the hangar is fucking empty as fuck no matter fuck off you (laughs) (laughs) but no matter how many times i did it it was just like a regular for me i still always got anxiety because i'm thinking like what's coming up behind me what's what am i if i look down what am i gonna see below my feet and uh but anyways i i was thinking about that when every time they showed that staircase it was just like yep creepy i can hear the creaking and all of that from walking on it i don't like it i don't want to walk across it during their first night in the house eleanor and theodore Theodora, Theo, are terrified by banging sounds made against the doors to Theo's room and hear the voice of a young girl echoing with laughter. Now they have adjacent rooms and this is the, like the detail in the rooms. I don't know why I don't like it. It's so busy. So many flowers. It's so oh, yeah, disorienting much, much. to me. The That disorienting feeling that you yeah. get, then you have this banging noise and I never forget it. I am in it and I feel those noises. Mm-hmm. The noises are worse than seeing something. Yes, absolutely. Have you ever, I know you all have seen horror movies where you're like, oh, if only they hadn't introduced the scary looking thing yep. so early. Or once you see the scary looking thing, it's, scary. it's like, oh, it's not scary anymore. Yeah. Um, but the sounds and the banging and it's like where the hell is that coming from and the Mm -hmm. creaking and the door knob turning all of that is happening uh eleanor hears it first and then she goes with theo and they're so sweet because they have like an instant connection they do Um, when they get when they first meet each other and they get introduced to each other it is you're you're right it's a very uh uh instant kind of like sisterly mm -hmm. because you know they're both bitchy to each other throughout the movie too but yet they always run to each other when exactly. they want support and all that. So it's a very sisterly um, because relationship. Because Theo picks on her several times and Nell snaps back. And it's mm-hmm. like, how is it that it's like they, they gave you this comfort, like if they've known each other yeah. for a long time, uh-huh. they instantly gravitated towards each other. They ran to each other for help in this situation. Mm-hmm. When they met, we find out that Theo is kind of like, what, psychic? Not psychic. Um, they... Did they describe her psychic? There was a word they used. I can't remember. But anyway, she has a, she gets yeah. feelings. She gets feelings. Intuition. Like yeah, intuition. intuition. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's why she's there. So she'll feel something coming. So, um, and then with, with Nell, she is being targeted. It's, it's what we start finding out. The, the pounding and all that, um, it reminded me, I think I mentioned this earlier, of like when I used to read scary stories and how I would imagine like when they would talk about the pounding in the other side of the house or on the door or whatever, um, that used to scare the shit out of me when I would read stories, ghost stories. And that's why I always say I'm a sucker for a good ghost story. Don't show me the fucking ghost because you've ruined it. And I think this movie did it well. The knocking, I felt it. I felt the knocking mm-hmm. from the other side of the house. So the next day while exploring the house, um, doctor, he the doctor he doctor (laughs) doctor um, are you in Uh, he discovers a cold spot outside of the nursery room and it's interesting because i like that he found an actual physical point Mm -hmm. to prove that there is a cold spot in this house right but when the women had mentioned that they felt something it wasn't so much believed it wasn't as at all um, who felt it first? And uh, are you sure? You both? Oh, but 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 I found something. Everyone, me. Okay. Uh-huh. <laughs> it, it's it's yeah. It's it's like. But it's I found this interesting though because he wanted to believe, but yet he was discounting all their shit. So I, I I'm yeah. not quite sure. 
Mm, what was up with that really? Other I think than... it, it, it definitely the, the time period because they were taught to discount what women were saying. And so he needed to find it himself. Like, uh, I'm not going to say you did it, but I myself as the man need to find it to, um, you know, to, to actually have something physical to show you that I believe you. After another night of loud disturbances, the team discovers scrawled on a wall and chalk the words help Eleanor come home, which causes Eleanor distress on the wall next to I think a giant portrait in the hall um, is where it's scrawled. I like how they mentioned that it was chalk like they, they touched it. It could easily be removed. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to lie. It does kind of feel like maybe Eleanor did write that, you know. Yeah. <laughs> well, so it, it's very I'm just interesting. Saying Awesome. No, no, no. It's, 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 it's very interesting because the story, the book itself that was written by Shirley Jackson, she was very deliberate and very outspoken about the fact that for her, she wrote it coming from that this was a supernatural story. These were mm -hmm. ghosts. However, Robert Wise, when he read it and he wanted to start doing this, the, the movie, he decided, well, he thought that it was more of a psychological uh, story that he wanted to really get into how he felt like this was Eleanor's story of her basically having kind of like, for lack of a better word, breakdown. And that's so that's how that's why we see it the way we do in the movie. Because um, it is like a little mix of yeah. both. Whereas in the book, it's definitely a supernatural book. Yeah. But I, I think it's coming more from the, the movie point of view. I think the mix of both leaves it as a movie for the people who are skeptics, yeah. for the people who like psychological thrillers as mm -hmm. opposed to your traditional supernatural ha haunted house. Yeah. So you story. can take away with it whatever. You can take away. Yeah. Uh -huh. This reminded me a lot of the, the book, reminds me a lot of the yellow wallpaper, which I did. Mm. Yeah, for our 31 days of Halloween. And we'll because, put a link in the show notes if you haven't heard that one yet. Yes, and it, it's a very short read and it's free to read or you can just listen to me read it badly. The woman in that story, it's, it's she is having a mental health breakdown, uh, but you can read it either as such or I read it very paranormally. 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 Um, I felt that that character in that story seeing that something there and moving and everything and I felt that or you can walk away thinking you know she was just you needing help and nobody helped her and it's really sad which was too. sad it was really yeah. sad because, <laughs> because it started you see it back back when she's at home and when you hear what she's gone through take uh, being the caretaker for her mother coming here being so excited to be there and everybody's picking up on it though that's the other thing everybody's picking up on the fact that Eleanor, that she has issues that should have been addressed long before, before. she ever came here. Yes, they, <laughs> they, everybody is very aware that she just lost her mom. She is telling a little, a kind of her own version of events, saying, I have a little apartment at home. Oh, that's but right away, too. right away, you can tell that the characters there don't believe that. They don't. They think she's lying right out the gate. And it's like they read her so well. And it's probably a product of the times where people were so you just say whatever you want. And um, I mean, maybe it's good sometimes when you can call somebody on their BS, but nobody had privacy. Everybody was, you know, just asking too many questions. And it was rude if you didn't answer them. You know, that whole era of you uh, people being in your personal space and there was just like you're rude if you don't let them in your personal yeah. space. So Eleanor, we're picking up on her is very, she's still dealing with the loss of her mother and we all see it. Plus all the stuff that's happening in the house, that stuff written on the wall though. I mean, that's picking on her. I'm just saying that it was plausible for anybody to believe that she could have yes, done it. Exactly. But yeah. when I saw it, I was like, no, I thought somebody was picking on her. Mm -hmm. especially because uh, they're being dismissive of how she feels except mm -hmm. for Theo. But even Theo feels like, did you write that on there? Yeah. You know, as her friend, a confidant. Yeah. So like Theo is supportive, him. but at the same time, Theo is also kind of real. Like, well, did you? <laughs> yeah. he, I feel that a lot. Like you, <laughs> I would back you up Dahlia and everything, but like somebody asked coming. me stuff. But then when I come to your house, I'll be like, did you do that? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> so yeah, so we're start we're seeing all these things around the house. So they get to explore, they get to experience. They have to every night they're supposed to be journaling uh, what's happened during the daytime and shit like that. Um, and do like a series of psychological tests as well. Yeah, and now also yeah. though Eleanor Nell, we, we go back and forth between Eleanor and Nell because she's referred to both in the story Nell more affectionately. So Eleanor, uh -huh. she is starting to be attracted to the doctor here so mm -hmm. and yes it's um, very plain to see yeah and she thinks i don't think she thinks that he is i think she thinks that it's possible i think was mm -hmm. what i took away from it that she thinks it's possible that they could develop a relationship here um, this is her, her real her real world ex how come i can't say that real world experiences with men are obviously limited this time and it, it's yeah. it's plain to see that she is reaching out to him and his uh, concern for her because at this mm -hmm. point they're like maybe we should stop doing this experiment and you should go home she's like adamant that she doesn't want to go home i'm mm -hmm. fine but he's concerned and she takes that concern for maybe he's reciprocating how I feel. I'm starting to feel towards him, mm -hmm. but it's obvious to everybody. They, they can all see it. Yeah. And that's yeah. the sad part too, because uh, she, her character was made to be odd, I guess is the best way to um, say it so the actress that played her um what's her name again uh julie harris julie harris said that if she could um she if she could change how she played her she would play her more odd those were her exact words yes, she thinks that, that she could have played her more odd but it's kind of funny because i'm thinking like how because when i'm looking at her i think she did a really good job of making us wonder you know like was it all mm. in her head you know, because uh, d there's there's certain points where it's just like, girl, you just need to get a hold of yourself. What what are you even talking about here? Um, and other times she was just kind of like the character Eleanor was just annoying and was like, calm the fuck down. Yes. What, what are you doing here? <laughs> She, um, I saw that she was trying to get very in, she got so much into character and you can mm -hmm. read this for yourself yes, that, yeah. um, the other act actors and everybody felt like she was isolating herself too much, mm -hmm. but she really wanted to get so much into her role that, that the other characters felt it in real life. Like they were like, uh, they felt like she wasn't interested in getting to know them, but it was really all self and imposed because she was trying to get so much into character. So I think looking back, she's like, yeah. I could have loosened up. Well, she also, it's, yeah, it's really still, cute. Uh, it's really cute. No, that's, that's, that's patronizing. Why did I say it's really cute? I apologize yeah. for that. It was a really good way of her approaching the role. What I, I uh, why I was saying cute was because afterwards she went up to uh, the actress that played Theo and apologized to her and said, um, this was just my way of approaching the role. And then they became friends. So um, yeah. Did we just become best friends? Yes. We did. <laughs> okay. So another spooky, spooky night. Cause that's what we're going to use. Dahlia said spooky. We're going to go. Okay. Eleanor is awakened by the sounds of a man speaking indistinctly and a woman laughing. Fearful, Eleanor asks Theo to hold her hand, and soon she feels a crushing grip. As Eleanor hears the sound of a young girl crying, she shouts at Eleanor. No, she shouts at whoever is causing the child pain. Theo awakens to find that Eleanor has moved from the bed to the couch, and Eleanor realizes it was not Theo's hand she held. That night, because this is when the doctor is like, you need to go home. You're this is too much. You yeah. can tell that it's college and you need some mental anguish. Uh -huh. And in a caring manner, everybody's like, Yeah, you should go home, but she yeah. doesn't want to. No. So he tells them to to sleep together. And so they go to bed together that night, very mad. That's what we brought up. Yeah. That they're talking. They're squabbling, they're squabbling, yes. their beds are pushed like, together. Yeah, and but the <laughs> beds are pushed together. And they're like, I'm going to bed now. <laughs> and then and then yet again, here we see Eleanor scared she reaches out for theo she thinks theo is holding her hand this is and... the trope that everybody loves when you're holding a hand yeah. and then it's it wasn't her hand yeah but even <laughs> though was... he went to bed angry she still reached out for her for her help uh uh theo when they woke up and they both realized shit was happening on separate sides of the room theo was still concerned about her so again i love that sisterly uh kind of uh, relationship that quickly formed between these two characters and 
coming back to the fact that that Theo is a character that is gay, I don't understand why there needed to be any kind of like heads up or whatever, like, oh, this character is gay. Um, because at the end of the day, other than being the reason she was there because she had just broken up with her girlfriend, you know, a long relationship. Um, and the fact that that's just well, that's who she saying. was, um, it didn't really come into play in the movie at all. I mean, you don't this ever is, see, except for this a, movie is perfect for now times. I'm sorry to interrupt is because yeah. I, the thing is her just being who she is, uh -huh. is fine. But the 1963, it was yeah. like a big deal. Yeah. Um, where now it's like, okay, this is what bothers me. We've come around so uh -huh. far that why aren't we seeing more people, more characters, more diversity. We need more queer characters uh -huh. and just part of the, part of the fucking cast. If they were doing it in 1963, mm -hmm. Why is it we are rarely seeing that diversity, you know? And it not be a big point of the movie other than because, when um, Eleanor yes. g tells her, you know, that that she was like, whatever. The what movie, what were her movie, words again? Um, unnatural. An she, unnatural. She call, well, she called her like a, a something, yeah, unnatural. Uh, 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 but, that, but even then, it was, even though it, it was a low blow, it was again how how fucking either best friends or sisters get at each other really ugly like oh you know like, just like, like you they clu because. they clueless like you know uh, uh at least i'm not a or, or you're a virgin who can't drive you know you're a virgin who can't drive. so you yes. know you you go for yes. it you go for it man but that's that's why how it was you so it wasn't again um like a, a big plot point of the movie is i guess what i'm trying to say for some of the scenes in which the characters are tormented by loud, ghostly sounds coming from the house, uh, Robert Weiss had the sounds on playback so the actors could react to them authentically. It was a technique that they found very useful and effective for creating just the right mood for terror. And I'm telling you that that scene where she woke up with a hand and they mm. zoom in and it goes back and forth like, what the fuck? I'm on the couch and you're on the bed. Yeah. That always gives me chills. I'm yeah. glad that I wait when I, when I don't watch it for a while and watch uh -huh. it again. I live in the moment of this <laughs> movie. I love Theo and Nell and their characters. I love them so much that when they did the remake too, I was just a little, a little, nah, I wasn't as surprised, but I just, uh, I was like, I guess it really didn't need to get remade when I thought about it because I thought it did it well. Remember? You know, I, I, I agree. Um, and the, the, the remake was like, it, it, doesn't get a lot of great reviews, but I do like the choice of actors. Lily Taylor, uh, as an L, I thought did a very good job. I love that woman so much. She was the perfect Nell. I think they redid it because sometimes you think that it needs to get redone because we have better cameras, we have better CGI, yeah. we have better better things. But the sound effects and that the way that the movie was shot didn't need any updating. Mm -mm. We're getting the vibe here in this movie. Like this woman is really at being attracted to this house it is calling to her she is feeling this house like nobody else it's exciting to be the center of attention in a good way for her she's yes she's thriving off of this she keeps talking about how it picks her it picked her and people mm -hmm. are they, they do pick up on that though they that the, the uh, uh activity seems to be centering around her so this is happening every night we're seeing it and then one night we see that um, his wife, the doctor's wife, shows up. Now, remember how we mentioned that Eleanor was had a crush on him? So she was thinking that it could be reciprocated. And Theo tried to tell her. She didn't tell her he, she was he was married. But she tried to tell her, like, hey, you know, you're embarrassing yourself, kind of. And that fucking pissed off Nell big time. She was just like, that. They again squabbling here and then mm -hmm. when the wife shows up Theo looks over at her like you know like you could you could see the pain in her her face as she saw Eleanor realize what happened there and and again that 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 bond I love that I love that they showed the relationship between these two women the wife comes and the wife is a skeptic a hundred percent but she um said that there's talk in town now 
people know what's up at the house, that what they're doing. So she came by, I guess, to tell him, and then she decides to stay the night. Uh -huh. And when she arrives also, the way that they ask him, how come he didn't mention that he had a wife? That always bothers me because it's like, number one, I understand him trying to keep his business and professional, but also he did if every know. No, he didn't. He never he said mentioned it to Theo. I they, they showed uh, it in the very beginning. Oh, then he mentioned it to Theo. But this yeah. is this. I'm talking specifically about Janelle. Oh, uh, gotcha. he should have said something because it was obvious to everyone else in the room that she mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. starting to feel attracted to him. Yeah. So it's like, why didn't he take a moment to say something to her? Uh, I understand keeping the business and professional. Yeah. But. And um, it, it's not like they're showing him flirting with, with uh, Nell or anything like that, but it just, he didn't say anything to her himself. So when you have to hear it from somebody else, you see it, it, it hurts you. Mm -hmm. And then your friends, when they come at you, I can see that point of hurt where you snap at them and they're like, yeah. you're just jealous. Because exactly. Exactly. I can see I can see all of that. So Grace announces that she plans to join the group and Nell said, why don't you stay in the nursery? Which that was really shitty. That was really yeah. fucking shitty. She snapped she realizes, back like that. Yeah. She realizes that, oh fuck, that was really mean. Please don't stay in the nursery. But the thing is, Grace is like, ghosts are not real. So I'm gonna stay there. Well, here's the thing too, though. Okay, so first of all. She she got jealous instantly. She mm -hmm. suggested the nursery because she knows the nursery is a hotbed of, of action. Uh -huh. But she didn't feel bad. She was starting to get jealous again because she keeps going on and on about how she was oh. picked by the spirits. The, uh -huh. the spirits picked me. It's supposed to be me. And she's afraid that Grace is going to get all the attention now. Not really because she's concerned for her, but more concerned that she's not going to get the attention now. So that's fucked up as well. So that night, everybody sleeps in the living room, but Grace is going to stay or in the, the parlor. Nursery. They sleep in, in the, the parlor. parlor. <laughs> the history. And the two <laughs> men are taking turns uh, um, patrolling the, the area, keeping watch and making sure that Grace So is this time... Everybody hears the loud banging and an mm. unseen intruder attempting to force its way into the room. The banging moved towards the nursery where sounds of destruction are heard. Eleanor runs towards the source and discovers Grace is missing. Um, but remember, when she goes to go find up to the thingy, when she runs up to the nursery, mm -hmm. uh, the Dr. Markway is there. And when he helps, like, he grabs her because she is like, I think that in hysterics here, because it's like, what the fuck is this? Everybody is hearing all this noise. Grace isn't in the room. She's starting to get like, oh my God, something is fucking happening. Mm -hmm. And he's like, uh, where is she? No. So it, it's good at this point that at least everybody heard the sounds. It's not mm -hmm. just Eleanor. Right. But nobody else saw Grace. So they... Um, but it scared the I, shit out of Grace. So she fucking runs off. We we don't know where, well, we, what. We'll was she grabbed? Her, yeah, wish she ran she, off. But we don't um, know if she was grabbed or whatever. They find that, like Alma said, the room in disarray. Um, she's fucking taken. The next morning, Eleanor, in um, she is just in a state of just, she needs to leave, man. She enters the library and well, climbs. She needs to leave, but she wants to stay. Everybody's yeah, trying to, to get her the fuck out the they door. They want to get her out of the house, and they find her climbing the dilapidated staircase, followed by Dr. Mm. Mar Markway, who tries to coax her down. Eleanor glimpses Grace's face through a trap door. Startled, she nearly falls to her death before being rescued by Dr. Markway, who has to climb that rickety staircase. So this, I was kind of pissed off during this going on. So I see what's happening to Eleanor. She, mm -hmm. it's either the house having, taking control over her, or however you want to look at it, but she is creating a situation where everybody is fixated on her now. And it's like almost an afterthought that Grace is missing. Yeah. We're, yeah. we're, we're, ha we're putting all our energy in all our people. What is it? One, two, three people. Yeah. They're like, we'll talk later. Yeah, but here we have everybody fixated on Eleanor because she is insistent that this, you know, I'm I, this is my my thing, this is my thing, this is my thing, and um, fucking Grace is gone. We don't know if it's time sensitive that we need to fucking find Grace, but what the fuck does that matter? Because over here, Nell is acting a fool. You know, 
what dude that, they didn't have they didn't have cell phones like now when we freak out we don't yeah. hear from someone in uh 30 minutes or something and you they should have so, been somewhere so that did that did then, me off. <laughs> she's in the house and she's lost what the fuck about that is normal that we are postponing looking for yeah. her so and, and the, the husband the doctor, Nell and drag yeah. her the fuck out of the house and the way he would talk about us like oh we need to get you out of here oh don't worry about it we'll find grace but we need to get you Oh, yes. but Gracie, you know, it's, it's just like, fine. <laughs> it's fine. You don't know where the fuck she is. That's it was not, very disturbing. I, I that, didn't. That's why like it's that. times people are like, oh, they'll be back. They ran away. Because back then, <laughs> when people disappeared, they didn't give a shit. So, <laughs> Eleanor runs towards um, the banking. Uh, let's see here. Da, 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 da. Um, okay. So, she almost dies on that staircase. Oh. Um, Markway becomes alarmed at Eleanor's obsession with the house in spite of its dangers. And Eleanor pleads to stay, but Markway insists that she leave. Eleanor drives off. Get in the fucking uh, there's, car. There's a, there's a whole scene here. They pack up her shit. I'm glad they at this point. Pack they up do. her because shit. Because you know what? In that day and time, they really just ignored the fuck out of mental health issues. It yeah. was like, let's put you behind a closed door. Mm -hmm. Let's get rid of you so we never have to see you. But these strangers, because they're fucking strangers to her, mm -hmm. are like, no, that's it. You're leaving. We don't even care because she says, I don't even have a little apartment. They're like, it doesn't matter. You're not staying here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You don't have to go home, but you need to get the fuck out. So yeah. they put her in her car and Luke um, is going to drive her so away. So Luke is one but, of the other guys we haven't really talked about, but yeah, no offense, he's just he doesn't really add. Air. He doesn't no, really he doesn't, add shit to the movie. He's just somebody to, to say, then you go. Um, so <laughs> He goes to get the keys to the gate because they're they're locked in there. And when he does that, she takes off. She's like, where the fuck did she think she was going? That's the thing. Because she yes. wants to stay in the house. She takes that opportunity when the dude gets out, because he was the one I was going to be driving, um, to scoot over to the driver's seat and take off. She wants to stay in the house. But I'm thinking, like, where the fuck was she going? I don't know. Maybe she's going to go hide in the fucking it's a, it's a big it's a big air. Uh, what do they call it? Land estate, whatever the fuck you want to call it. Um, so probably maybe hide somewhere <laughs> um, on the on the property. Uh, but so yeah, she's she's driving off. She's taking off. And then she's just I don't know if we mentioned this, but the movie is 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 uh, narrated by her. It's narrated by her thoughts. And I like that. Um, usually a, a narration, narration annoys the fuck out of me, but I liked it in this movie because we see what's going on. Cause if we were just looking at her, I think it would be really hard to tell a lot of what's going on. But it, when she's narrating, she's talking about, you know, whatever's going on. But in this case, it's like, she wants to stay, um, you know, and then we find out that something takes over the fucking vehicle driving it. She's driving, but then she's not. And so, she like loses control, but not so much because she was driving just fine when yeah. she's driving Well, she's driving erratically, but in the fact that she's speeding away and has no way to get yeah. out unless the gates open, yeah. but something takes over the vehicle. And then we see grace pop out of fucking nowhere. Yeah, um, remember grace, the, the, the wife that was <laughs> missing been looking for, she all of a sudden is out in the road. And then the car swerves directly into a tree. And this kills now. Okay, so what you just said right now, I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, uh, talk about that for a minute. Okay, so like we were saying, uh, Nell's driving; she's in control of the vehicle. Then she isn't. She gets scared, but then she accepts it. She accepts what's going on in the vehicle. Now, you said she swerved away from Grace when she popped up in the street or in the road, but she was already going towards the tree. Grace pops up in the corner of her vision. And so the reason I bring that up is because, yes, you could say she swerved away from Grace to hit the tree, or you can say she was going straight for the tree and saw Grace. Grace says, no, she was already headed towards the tree because when they come up and they find out and they see Grace, again, they don't seem as excited to see Grace here. <laughs> no, and Grace, Grace looks like in a state. She looks <laughs> fucked up. Uh, but Grace is like, no, she was already headed towards the tree. I saw it. That's when I can't, you know, when I saw what was going on, she did see me. 
Um, but then, uh, so you could take it either way. She swerved away from Grace. She was already going towards the tree. But whatever it was, it was Luke, though, Luke says that yeah. she was aiming for the tree, but I didn't she, think she was. She well, it kind of looked like, but I, I like I like the way they did it because it kind of looks like either way, whichever way you want to take it. Mm -hmm. Was did she swerve or was she already headed that way? But here's the uh, here's the thing: the tree, the tree is the tree that the first wife from ninety years before. Um, where she had her accident. So that tree has a history. Coincidence? I think not. Well, <laughs> and is there any truth? So Grace had managed to get out of the house, and now she's a believer because this is where we find her. And she looks scared as shit. I'm a and Theo remarks that Eleanor got what she wanted to remain with the house, convinced mm -hmm. at last that the supernatural forces he once scoffed at, Luke says, solemnly it ought to be burned down and the ground sowed with salt that was our very our, dramatic our yes very dramatic. i wish we could be dramatic like that these days maybe i should start writing some dramatic lines so i could end my day with you know this day um, should be burned to the ground <laughs> this day yes that's true though a lot of the days 2021 2020 burn it to the ground and sow it with salt um <laughs> So Grace, though, I just thought, whoa, perfect timing, because honestly, I love that they showed her there and that she popped out because I was going to be really pissed off if she wasn't there or shows up somewhere else later. No, she's like, no, I was there. I, she saw me. She looked right at me uh -huh. um, because they didn't see her. Mm -hmm. They were watching the car. Yeah. Um, so now they're all believers Believe. and no one can stay with the, with their haunted spooky house. So that yeah. was, that was, yeah, that was what Theo would basically said that um, she wanted to stay at the house. She didn't want to leave. They were making her leave and now she's died there and she's a ghost of the ghosts. Now, it was, sadly, her, her character, her story is so sad and depressing. This ending yeah, I fucking I triggered like the shit out of me. I didn't I didn't know that it was going to be a car crash. I'm not going to lie. It, it was it was hard to watch. But um it it's so fucking depressing. It's so, it's so sad. I don't like I didn't like the way it landed because they were also kind of indifferent and it always seems like that in the older movies. Oh, that yeah. guy's dead. Oh well. They yeah. were. It was very they wrapped they wrapped it up. She's dead. And then, like, oh, this they they made their their little uh, uh they their own ending to it, you know, him saying this, Theo saying that, the doctor, the and then everybody just was done. <laughs> A woman is dead in the car, and they were done. Yeah, that's it the was end. Sad. <laughs> so the movie elements of the ghosties which i loved because like i said I, I love the the knocking and all that. that that's the way the way it was shown on screen was the way i imagined it like when i would read the ghost stories when i was little um the sad um you know uh just downfall of her of her sanity was really sad or was it like the ghosties kind of fucking with her you know mm -hmm. you know keeping her there and then the ending. Come on, man. What the fuck? <laughs> this is this is my best version of a ghost story. This is in my, I, I always say in my top 10 and I have 100, 200, 300 favorite Mine's movies. always changing, yeah. But this has definitely always been in my top 10. This is always going to be included yeah. in my top 10. I love that you don't see a ghost. Mm -hmm. You um, are just haunted because in, in real life as skeptical as I am, I'm always going to not say that I don't believe because I don't want to be really haunted one day. So, <laughs> But the scariest shit that I'll ever encounter in my life isn't going to be something that I saw. It's going to be something I heard. Mm. And in this movie, and that's what it is. Exactly. Is that it's something you heard. That's why when I go to bed at night and I go to sleep, I, sl I don't sleep in complete silence. I refuse to complete to sleep in complete silence. I'm a I don't believe in shit. Okay, I don't care if you do. I understand. I get it. I get it. I used to. But I even I won't sleep in complete silence because I'm afraid of what's going to be. I'd rather someone, a ghost, a monster, a person be whispering, talking up shit all over in the corner, under the bed, in the closet, in the other room, and me not hear them because I have the TV on. I have the TV on with Golden Girls playing in the background, lulling me to sleep. <laughs> 
that's that's my life. I really yeah, I don't like quiet in quiet. Fuck that. Quiet thing. or darkness. I sleep or darkness. with lights on. I sleep the best during the middle of the day when there's everybody just doing all their shit and mm. the TV's blasting. I just I don't feel comfortable. And I love quiet. that about Alma. So when we travel, me and Alma get to be room buddies because like when we went to Mexico in November, me and Alma yeah. shared a room and had the TV on. Uh, when we slept, we chose the one light was on. I don't give a shit. <laughs> and just, our sister Nacy is in the other room with everything fucking. Dark black, and, like, silence. Fuck that shit. That's creepy. How the fuck do you so, do that? So you're just cool with hearing in the middle of the night? Or your own Is thoughts. Is that what we're cool with? Or, or my own just... thoughts. I don't want to be left alone with my own thoughts. Fuck you're that. Just, you're just leaving it open to being haunted when you sleep like that. I'm just... Haunted everyone. by ghosts, haunted okay, by your own so, thoughts, haunted by whatever. Obviously, we like we love the movie. We like it. It's a good movie. Um, if it's, you know, your bag, it's our bag. It's my um, bag of chips. I am going to talk about the Fox sisters. Now we're talking about like, you know, ghosty stuff, the paranormal. Alma's making a mustache with her hair. It looks pretty cool. I like it. Very, uh, 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 what's that guy's name? Samity Sam. <laughs> because it's red. Yes. Yes. Yo, Samity Sam. Why did you call them Samity Sam? Because it's funny. <laughs> So I'm going to talk about the Fox sisters. They were three sisters who are basically credited with popularizing spiritualism. Um, Now, spiritualism had been around, but with these three ladies, it basically fucking took off. Now, spiritualism is the belief that or the practice that spirits of the dead can communicate with the living. And we can see this with the seances and Basically, that's the gist of it. So the sisters were Leah, Maggie, and Kate. Now, their career as mediums, yes, I said careers, started with Maggie and Kate. Maggie and Kate were 14 and 11, respectively. They lived in an old farmhouse in Hydesville, New York, and demonstrated to a neighbor that their house was haunted. Now, you can read all about this again. Read all about it. I'm going to keep doing that. I don't know why. Because there's there's lots of biograph- biographical, autobiographical, lots of information out there about their lives, this house, everything. So I'm just going to give you all like a very short summary, but I'm going to hit the points, man, because this, their story is very interesting in, in the world of spiritualism. Okay. So they convinced the neighbor. This soon grew to others in the community, community becoming witnesses to the girls and their abilities. It was like really fucking fascinating at the time. Remember how I said spiritualism already existed, but these two girls just kind of made it like really fucking cool. At this time of their lives, they were living at home with their mother and father. But because of all the excitement and everything that was going on, the parents sent them to go live with their older brother and their older sister. Okay, so that was Maggie and Kate, remember. But I did mention three sisters, right? This is where Leah comes into the picture. Now, Leah is older than them. I can't remember exactly how much older, like 20. Yeah, 20 years older. We see the different, they, a lot of prominent people. They We had politicians. We had, what do they call them? Like religious people people like pastors and shit like that, uh, uh, famous people, intellectuals that were loving the fuck out of these two girls. They started making the rounds in in not just people's homes, but like in actual public uh, uh, places so that they can, um, you know, work their magic. At this time in their lives, they were living at home with their mother and father, but because of all of the excitement, they were soon sent off to live with their older brother and sister separately. So they were living separately, one with the brother, one with the sister. Um, now that's Maggie and Kate, but like I said, there was three sisters that were known as the Fox sisters, and that's Leah. That's where Leah enters the picture. I want to get into how these girls turned from rapping, rapping, not rapping like, you know, rapping, but rapping like... <laughs> so they turned from rapping that's what it was called spiritual rapping in a farmhouse in new york to creating the movement of spiritualism and helped to grow it into the sensation among the affluent and well to do because that's really where it really took off if you had like regular poor people working class people doing this shit we're fucking like weirdos we're we're fucking with satan and shit like that but you got intellectuals, you got the rich doing it. Oh, it's a fucking hoot, man. So that's okay. So Maggie and Kate's reputation followed them from their new homes to uh, 
when they moved in with their siblings. And so they were able to continue to, uh, to wow the masses with the strange phenomena that surrounded them. Uh, when friends of the family heard about their abilities to communicate with the dead, they began making the, again, like I said, the rounds in people's homes and their first official public seance. They started making bank, man. This is where Leah, man, she saw what was going on here. And she's like, yeah, she became their fucking manager. They had a manager, these two girls. So I'm going to give it to Leah here, though. She's smart. She found a way to capitalize on these girls' abilities. She was able to attract pretty prominent people to come and pay for these basically performances. Politicians, religious leaders, intellectuals, people flock to them wanting to gain insight into business dealings. Religious leaders, you know, wanted to know about what's going on on the other side. Um, people wanted, you know, help with their personal relationships, the state of world affairs. And of course, then you had people who just wanted to communicate with their loved ones. And they paid money. They paid a lot of money for this shit. So how did the girls do this? We see with uh, seances, we think of things like uh, automatic writing, which interestingly is called psychography. I like that. Uh, furniture, levitation, horns, other sounds, uh, spirit, uh, uh, taking over bodies, talking, shit like that. They use what's called spirit wrapping. Now, this is the way I understand it. So what they did was they would make contact with the spirit. And then when they made contact, they would, in a sense, teach that spirit their code. Kind of like it's a Morse code, but it's their special code of, of the wrapping, the tapping, right? So once the ghost or the spirit knew that way of communication, then they were able to have a conversation because now they both knew the same language, essentially. So it was, uh, you heard the taps, the knocks, or like I said, the rapping. So the Fox sisters were so successful that they were able to branch out on their own. So they were a team for a really long time. So they was, it was like the Fox sisters. They were also able to branch out and do their own thing. So we had Maggie over here. We had Kate over here and Leah sometimes managing both, none, whatever. Um, they were so popular that one of them even married a famous medium. Like, so they became a thing. Their lives are very much more involved. And sadly, also, it includes that they both became addicted to alcohol. They started having troubles with alcohol. So that is a part of their lives as well. Um, and I think that kind of does play into what in eventually ends up happening. Here's the thing. The Fox sisters were frauds. And what's interesting about this is even to this day, a lot of people know the story of the Fox sisters. They know the story about the Heightsville house, all of that stuff, but they don't know that they were frauds. They don't know that they faked it. They just know that these sisters existed and that they did all this. So it was all essentially a parter trick. It started out as fun, screwing around with the neighbors. They were getting attention. It was a good time. Started out with what they did was crack their joints. But the, the cool thing is that they could crack their joints without anybody seeing them crack their joints. And how do we know that they were frauds? Because one of the sisters told on themselves. <laughs> That's how we know. They were able to get away with it so easily because when you have willing participants in the fraud, basically people who want to believe, people want to believe that their deceased one, loved one talking to them, that there's something else other than what's in front of them. So Basically, they were always being surrounded by people who, who wanted it to be true. So it was very easy to convince them. So when the sisters moved out of the home and Leah entered the picture and everything like that, Leah was able to help them kind of grow this, this farce, basically. Um, and they started being able to, remember how I said it's joint uh, uh, cracking and all that? They were able to start utilizing so many joints of their body and they would like basically exercise their muscles so that you can never see them doing it. Uh, um, their toes, under shoes, their, their uh, ankles. I bet it helped and, all that clothes. That I was going to say, <laughs> I was going to say under all this clothing, it was so easy to hide it. Um, and then, so 
but again, also where we have stories of people saying that they heard the person behind them and, and, you know, uh, uh, Kate or Maggie was sitting in front of them. There's a phenomenon. I can't, I, I, I can't remember what it's called, but basically it's like, um, when you close your eyes, you're blindfolded and you hear a sound somewhere in the room, you're not going to be able to tell exactly where it comes from because, um, there's, you know, sight, it, it, it the sight and, and our hearing are, you know, um, they're connected somehow, but anyways. So when you're expecting the sound not to come from the person in front of you, you're going to hear it somewhere else. Um, and also, when you think about the old homes and the public spaces that they used for all of these demonstrations, was a lot of it that it was it's a lot more the the construction, the architecture, the wood, everything like that. The sound was able to bounce off in ways that it always sounded like it was coming from somewhere else too. So it bounce off the floor, it bounce off the walls. If they was in a, in a public, uh, um, what do they call them? Uh, the places where uh, auditorium, uh, auditorium. Thank you. Where it's made to the the sound is made to like bounce off of different places. Uh, it always sounded like it was coming from somewhere else. So like I said, how do we know they were frauds? Because Maggie confessed. Later in life, Maggie confessed. She she didn't just confess though. She fucking demonstrated. She went up on stage into a public space to show you guys, hey, this is how I did it. And she did everything that they ever did in a show or, 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 or a seance or whatever and showed people this is how I did it. And yeah, people got pissed. <laughs> people people got pissed. were angry? No people, way. <laughs> people were angry, but it's not for the people that you think. I don't think Pe the people that were angry were other uh, spiritualists, other mm. spiritualists, because it's like she was telling their secrets. She oh, was yeah. just uh, like the magicians when yeah, they started. Uh, exactly. She was, she, so, it, but it wasn't just her word though. So it wasn't just like, Hey, no, no, she's trying to get attention in a different way. No, she, she, they had people, not just Leah, they had other people helping them throughout this whole thing. So it wasn't ever just them. So we yeah, could because have, when one person comes forward, mm -hmm. then they're all the, the show people. This was something that was going on for a while. We're having productions. We're having yeah. shows. We're having yeah. all these people. And then the, the handling the money, that means everybody was in. Yeah. Office. But yeah. So, so some part of her like little assistant crew, they come out and say, you know, this is how we did it. Blah, 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 blah. Um, but like I said, the spiritualists were pissed, you know, and they're like, uh, you need to take that back because you're ruining our fucking business. And, sadly a year later she did she she took she recanted the confession because um remember how i said that unfortunately the sisters didn't live you know very uh, i mean they, they were addicted to alcohol so they she was starting to not have money basically i guess it's the best way she's starting to live in poverty and so uh she recanted it and tried to get back into the biz but by then it was too fucking late it's really sad. It's really fucking sad. Um, so yeah, uh, they basically were, she was shunned and uh, the two sisters ended up dying about a year apart from each other, um, both in poverty. Uh, Maggie died at the age of 59 and Kate at 55. So not old. They weren't old. That's, that's pretty fucking young. And they did. They lived in poverty the last of their years and um, they were frauds by their by uh, Maggie's own admission but the story you probably hear a lot is that you don't hear that last part you don't hear that they faked it and you probably don't hear that they died hey, sad hey, alone hey, hey. and uh, <laughs> shut up and um in poverty so that's the thank story. you thank you for that very sad story to end this, this uh, sad movie the fox sisters <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I didn't when I when I started writing it up or looking this up. First of all, like I said, there's so much information out there. I didn't I didn't. Their lives are not just this. They mm -hmm. had very interesting lives uh, um, through their years, their marriages, stuff like that. So um, it's not just these few paragraphs that I read. But what um, when I was reading about it, it was just like I thought it was going to be a little bit more interesting and not sad. <laughs> It's both. Don't get me wrong. But as yeah, I, I, I like the came to the conclusion, ending, I was yeah. like, but I had already started it. And I was just like, you know, but it is an interesting story. And I hope that people, 
if, if you don't know the story, you'll read up on them. If you only knew half of the story, definitely go look up the rest. Um, but even if, if, okay, so like, even if you still don't believe that they were frauds, interesting, right? Interesting conclusion to their story. Um, even if you have never believed in anything, um, again, interesting story of being able to uh, capitalize on basically a really cool talent, popping the shit out of your joints and convincing people <laughs> of shit. Like when um, I was a kid, I saw those people who would make the foil come out of their eyeballs. And so <laughs> remember that? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I okay, got a visual so just now. I'll add a funny story to end this on because my kid broke her foot and um, the, uh, for a few days refused to walk on it. And, you know, uh, everybody's different, but she will not move. And it's just like, I need to see if this is an actual legit injury. So I got mother of the year award over Christmas break. And on Christmas days when she broke it, it wasn't until I think four days later that we had an x-ray, but because she refused to fucking move. And she is so scared of supernatural stuff that I would, I, I got an egg mostly in jest, mostly in jest. <laughs> sana, sana, colita de rana. And she was like, do not put that fucking egg <laughs> and rub my body. Don't do it. I refuse to have, and I was like, Okay, but you're going to regret it tomorrow if you don't let me rub the egg and sana sana you. Oh, my God. And just like the just like the rhyme goes, I was like, when we found out it was broken, I was like, it's because you didn't let me rub the egg. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, you're evil. <laughs> we saw not because she didn't let me sana her. <laughs> Well, she, I, she brought it upon she herself. Was, she, she brought it upon basically, <laughs> I could have healed her. <laughs> I was terrified of having the egg rubbed on me. I didn't want them to oh, rub I, the I, egg I, on me and then have them crack it open and see it all bloody and crap. I was a, I was terrified of 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 it being cracked. So I see and where she red. was coming from. Okay, <laughs> I was so <laughs> afraid seeing the red, and I fuck. That's it. That's it. The demons inside me. <laughs> 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 oh my god oh my god yeah that that shit was traumatizing it okay <laughs> all right so that's the story uh that's the movie the haunting that's the story of the fox sisters and that's the story of alma being mother of the year all right thank you everyone if people decide to continue on with us and why would you the also <laughs> continue after this shit show <laughs> I think we're funny. <laughs> Visit our website at nightmaremoviepodcast.com. Uh, Dali has like, um, really has a great website and it has all our episodes, all our shit, all our socials. Pleasure. So you can find us on Instagram at Nightmare Movie Podcast. What? Our Twitter is Nightmare on Fifth. That's Nightmare on Five PH. Uh, you can email us at Nightmare Movie Podcast at gmail.com. And Dalia, push that Patreon. Oh my God, I'm so embarrassed for you. <laughs> hey, you did worse in the game. Okay. <laughs> Patreon. <laughs> Patreon.com slash nightmare movie podcast. Or if you would like to buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash nightmare pod. And yeah, that's all the good stuff. Thank you for listening. Appreciate you. <laughs> it's a great way to stay in shape. Bye bye. <laughs>